Let's Talk Supply Chain. Hey, Christine. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. So for anybody who doesn't know you, why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Uh, I am Christine Barnhart. I am the Chief Marketing and Industry Officer for a supply chain innovator uh, called Nulogy. Uh, we focus very heavily around supplier collaboration and operations improvements in the fast-moving consumer uh, goods industry and really specific to like external manufacturing, which is you know, kind of kind of forgotten in people's mainstream supply chain, but is such an area right for for innovation and improvement. Um, I've been in the tech on the the dark side of supply chain uh, in technology for about five years. So uh, did a stint with Infor doing strategy, a, a startup out of Atlanta called Verison and now Nulogy, which I really love. It, it appeals to the whole reason I transitioned from like manufacturing and operations into technology, which which is that, you know, we have these new tools and techniques and processes, but they're often not understood. Um, people don't understand the value. They kind of go to like, oh, well, is it an ERP or is it a planning system? And you're like, no, 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 it's a, it's a multi-enterprise collaboration network. And, um, you know, what appealed to me was that after years of doing planning and sourcing and and whatnot. And you you would like build this giant, like this beautiful, wonderful global master plan. And then like somebody would call you and they would be like, oh, it it didn't, this didn't make the truck or this never got started in production. Right. Or and they're like, you got to change the plan. And and this, you know, really helps to eliminate that. So um I'm only just now getting to like the point where I can kind of call myself a technologist, um, but I identify really as a practitioner. I spent 20 plus years in uh, maintenance process quality um, and then moved into um, planning and purchasing and multiple industries too, right? So really diverse, 12 years with Whirlpool, six years with Mead Johnson Nutrition and Infant Formula, and then uh, three years leading supply chain transformation with Very Global. So uh, a lot of different in industries, a lot of different functions. Yeah. And the, co the company that you're working for right now, I do have to give a shout out because it's Canadian and I'm Canadian and you're American and you're working for a Canadian company and that doesn't happen all the time. No, so, it's. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been really, it's, uh, you know, I think before this, if somebody would have asked me, I was like, oh, you know, it's like, it's like US light, like Canadians are like US light. That is so not true. Uh, completely different culture. Um, there, not that there aren't some shared, you know, characteristics and history and whatnot. Um, but I really love it. I, if it wasn't so darn cold uh, up in Canada, Sarah, I would be like, yeah, move me. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. And one of the things, so Christine and I uh, were recently at the Woman in Supply Chain Forum in Atlanta, and you poor thing, you were not feeling very well, no. but man, you trooped through that because you had to be on stage. And actually, one of the things that you said while you were on stage was the fact that women in Canada get like 12 to 18 month mat leave. And I yeah. think the whole room literally groaned out loud and it was, like a, it was a collective gasp yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> they were like oh, you know um I think it's lovely um and, and you know it's optional right so like not everybody takes it um we have one of our product managers uh, literally last week was her last week she's going on mat leave she's choosing to take like five six months uh honestly I probably would have been in that category as well I can't imagine um being at home with my children <laughs> for 12 to 18 months uh because that's just that's just not who I am but I love that it's like an option that's available yeah. and that you know if you want to spend that time. And I do think it's, it's really critical, important time. You, you know, you can, and it's yeah. not detrimental to like your standard of living and your, right. your growth as a professional. So, yeah, I, you know, uh, I get continually aggravated with the concept of, a uh, of American exceptionalism because, 
you know, we think that we're, you know, our, our perception of ourselves and how we really fit, I think, in the globe um, are really different. And you can design your own life that way when you have the choices in front of you as well, yeah. which I think is really what everybody's looking for now. So now one of the things that I find really amazing about you is how much you give back to the industry and you do it in a variety of different ways through a variety of different organizations. Um, and you're one busy lady as it is. So I don't even know how you find time to do any of this, but can you talk to us about the impact that you've been able to make, some of the organizations that you've worked with, what you've done with them. Because sometimes, you know, people look at, you know, volunteering and they're like, oh no, I don't have time for that. But sometimes it's really just volunteering your expertise here and there, yeah, yeah. right? So talk to us about the organizations that you've been involved in and what that's looked like. I would say that my involvement, uh, you know, in particular with, like nonprofits and and other organizations is almost as eclectic as like my work experience. Um, it's a bit all over the map. Um, you know, I, I really started, I mean, honestly, I started volunteering when I was still in, in school in like mm -hmm. elementary and, and even high school, I'm a third, fourth generation Girl Scout. And so, you know, it was just part of the culture of, and, and part of kind of, I guess, the expectation uh, within my family, which is that, you know, people give to you and, and if you have skills, you should give them back to the community. And so, um, you know, I was involved in wish upon a star for mm -hmm. many years, um, really kind of like that project management, leveraging my ability to manage projects and, and giving that resource to the, to the organization. I, I was on the board for an air show, um, it's kind of similarly, right, right? So these are really complex organizations. They, they produce complex events mm -hmm. and they need people that kind of, you know, can like build a spreadsheet with timelines and tasks and, and whatnot. Um, you know, recently, uh, was a founding member of an organization really focused on getting women more like better educated and more involved in, you know, government and policy and politics mm. uh, in a in a nonpartisan kind of a fashion. And, you know, I think part of that is it's it's a little overwhelming for a lot of people. And um, and there's just so much animosity and strife. And so, you know, really felt like it was important to uh, bring forward, you know, expert voices, provide, you know, multiple perspectives and demystify like that process mm -hmm. a bit. So, you know, I think for, for me, um, I, I sometimes spread myself a little thin. I've gotten better <laughs> at recognizing that as I've gotten older and kind of knowing when I need to like, you know, pump the brakes a little, a little bit. Um, so, you know, right now I'm in a new role. We have a whole new org. Um, so I'm kind of in that process of being like, okay, you like, I, I still want to be involved, but I need to take a step back for, right. you know, six months and then um, we can, we can re-engage. And I think that's something I've learned over time, you know, that you, um, if you want to be effective in, in helping, you know, others and other organizations, you got to be realistic as to, you know, what you can really handle at that moment in time. And, yeah. you know, sometimes you're, you're there for an event. Sometimes you're, you're there you know, maybe for, you know, a season or a couple of years or, or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, and honestly, I think if you look at where I've been engaged, you know, for me, three, four, five years, and then I generally feel like I've contributed what I can yeah. and, and I'm going to give that seat to somebody else. Yeah. And, and I'll I, look, I'll still support you. Call me if you need help. Um, but it's time for somebody else to kind of have a, a leadership role. Yeah. And I agree with all of that. I mean, I'm a founder of a nonprofit and I know we've had the same thing with some of our board members and we appreciate it, right? You come yeah. to us and say, listen, I just need a couple of months. I'm in a new role, mm -hmm. you know, want to yeah. come back, that kind of thing. But the communication really is key. And yeah. I think you're also right in a position around a board. So I'm actually stepping back from a board that I've been a part of for 12 years. And I've actually oh, wow. been a part of it for 20, just not at the board level. At yeah. the board level, it's been about three terms. I'm at the end of my three terms. And it's the Forum for International Trade Training out of Ottawa. And you're right. 
you know, it's come to the point where I think they need somebody else in there with new ideas, with a fresh perspective. And it's not that I'm not going to support them. I will always support them. They are an organization that's always going to have a piece of my heart and I will be there if they need anything. Um, but it's time for me to step away from yeah. the board as well. And I think you just need to know, right? And I think right. the communication, listening to your gut, not sitting in a position for too long, because there are really other other great people yeah. out there that can do that. Now let's um let's you've you've supported the industry, you've supported a bunch of nonprofits. Let's talk about how women support each other. <laughs> now, this is not necessarily something that I do talk about all the time on the show, but because it's you and you and I have a great relationship, we kind of can talk about anything. Um, I want to talk about it a little bit because I'll tell you, you know, running the Woman in Supply Chain series on the podcast and a blog and the blog, it's been very frustrating in the fact that we feature all these amazing women and they have so much to say and their journeys are incredible and people learn from them, but they don't promote it. And I don't need the promotion. I want them to promote it for themselves. I want their right. friends and families and colleagues to understand yeah. their journey and what that's looked like, what they've had to overcome, the advice that they would give people because it's so valuable and it makes an impact on so many people. But as women, I feel like we just don't take those kinds of opportunities by the horns and run with it. What do you think? I think it's, um, I think I, I would kind of, divide this into two things. One is women promoting themselves. And I think a lot of women, yeah. myself included, um, it, it, it's uncomfortable sometimes. So like, uncomfortable. You don't, you don't, I, you know, like I, like I can intellectually be like, oh, I've done these great things, do, 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 do. but mm -hmm. then to like say, oh, you know, like I'm a leader, I'm a, that feels really uncomfortable, right? Like I feel like I'm being arrogant or, uh, and I think some of that is just the history of kind of how society has has trained women to act. And so for me, I have to think about it and I have to overcome it. Um, and, and I have to be really conscious of the fact that people don't just notice that you are doing great things. You have to take credit for your work yes. and you have to be proud of it. And it doesn't mean that you're like bragging all the time, but but you, you have to be you know purposeful. I think the other side of that is, for whatever reason, there are women that are very, very supportive of other women. Mm -hmm. And there are women that fit into the category of competitive. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't ever want to be in that second category. Um, I work every day to make sure that I'm you know, supporting women that work for me, that work with me, that, you know, work above me, whatever that may be. And, um, and my goal is, is always to, to move women forward. But I have personally interacted with women that I, I would tell you, um, they want to be the only woman in the room and that right. it, it diminishes, they, they feel diminished if they aren't the only woman. And, um, and I think that that is, <clears throat> it's just really frustrating <clears throat> and, um, uh, you know, for me, um, I'd rather work for a man that's biased all day long, uh, than work for a woman that that's like that, to be honest, because it's just so incredibly difficult. It really is difficult. I've been in those, those situations as well. And I think we need to just do a better job at it. But what I will tell you is it does take work, mm -hmm. right? You oh, don't does. come across, you don't, be, you're not supportive necessarily overnight. There actually is a lot of internal work, I think, from a personal perspective <laughs> that we have to do to be yeah. able to be that supportive person. A lot of people don't want to do that work. I've been working on that for a very long time and I'm still working on it. It's a journey, right? Everybody has little triggers that are going to come up and to be aware of those and understand. And it's almost like when that jealousy comes up, what it is, what, why is that a trigger for me? And what has yeah. happened in my past that I need to figure out Yeah. so that I can be supportive and not jealous? No, hundred percent. I mean, I just literally had this experience, uh, on a board that I sit on, we have some new members and, um, you know, it, and it wasn't like a male, female thing. It was like these, these new members came in and they're bloody brilliant. I mean, I'm just like, in awe. And, and yeah, you know, I could kind of be, I could kind of feel like, 
like I was, it, like a little bit of imposter syndrome on my part right. and a little bit of like my shackles getting up. And I was like, whoa, full stop. Like, like I can, these are people I can learn from. Um, yeah. They're not belittling me. I'm getting into my own head. Right. And, and damn it. Like I may not intellectually uh, or, you know, be on their level, but I have a lot of other skills and, and you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You don't have to be the most accomplished person in the room to provide value. So yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I think, I think to your point, it's something you have to work on every day, every day. Yeah. yeah. I think everybody has to work on it, but I, you know, I watch, you know, men, right. There, let's say one of them doesn't have a job anymore. The other one will help them get a job. And then that person will make sure that they have business from the other person. So they're constantly like sharing the wealth and sharing the support and lifting each other up and moving each other forward. And I'm like, you know what? We want to get to that. Yeah. So how do we get to that? And how do we talk about this more? And how do we, you know, oh, you know what? She helped me do that. I'm going to return the favor and make sure I buy one of her products or make sure we bring her on right? As maybe a contractor. I don't know yeah. what that looks like, but I feel like our brains aren't necessarily as wired like that. Yeah. And we have to be a little bit more intentional about it, but I think we can totally do it. We just yeah. need to get over some of those hurdles. Yeah. And I think, you know, part of it is just, um, and, and so I, I think you and I, we're, we're like a bit of an outlier, right? I have worked with men my entire career. Uh, mm-hmm. I have two boys. I'm like surrounded by men. And on you go to football basis. games, just saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Go to a lot of football games, lacrosse <laughs> games, soccer games, whatnot. So honestly, like I tend to, I tend to think more, like I, I, I have a lot of characteristics and a lot of mannerisms. Um, that they kind of mimic the men that I've been around my whole career, mm-hmm. as do many of the women that I've worked with, right? So I've been really lucky, like there may be one, you know, I work for a woman who works for a woman, and we're like the only three women in the org. But mm-hmm. so, so I do think like, for me, I kind of do those things that you're talking about kind of naturally. I mean, just like, you know, with my role at Newlogy, I was like, gosh, we got to be out there more. We need to do more virtual events. And my first phone call was to you because I trust you and I value what you do in the industry and you're my friend. And so I'm like, yo, Sarah, like we want to do a podcast. (laughs) Um, How do I do that? Right. Like, (laughs) You know, and and it's not me saying, yo, help me do this for free. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, this is your business and you're really good at it. And I trust you. And so why wouldn't I spend our money with you? Right. Like Mm -hmm. that's part of like having a small business. And, and like, for me, I love to keep my dollars when I say local, like with the people that I know and love and trust, right? right? When they're successful, man, that makes me feel great, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think the same is true in business. Yeah. Well, and let's talk about that because the other thing that I wanted to talk about is why we don't invest uh, in ourselves more. <laughs> um, secondly, why don't we invest in other small underrepresented businesses more, whether it's products, whether it's services, whether you have the money or you don't, because even a social media like repost, share, whatever that looks like, that doesn't cost any money, you know, promoting somebody else's business. Why do you think it is that we don't invest in ourselves and we invest in others more? Why do you think, because I feel there is this like underlying thing where like women should be doing things for free. And I'm like, absolutely not like we need to be getting paid for what we're doing we need to get paid well for what we're doing and that's not a bad thing what was it katie said at the conference ask for the money don't be the money baby exactly (laughs) yeah uh you know again i think i think some of it is is long-standing cultural you know kind of boat anchors Mm -hmm. um you know for, for women Um, and do I think it's changing? I do, but I think when you think about cultural norms and stereotypes and, and, and even, you know, subconsciously, um, what we're training young women on today, I think, unfortunately, you got to be really prescriptive and conscious to overcome it. And, um, you know, I think part of it is people don't know how to self-promote. Like mm-hmm. I wasn't good at it at all when I was younger and and I would get frustrated. I'm doing a great job. Why don't people notice? 
that I'm doing a great job. Yeah. So now I'm, I'm, I have to think about it. It doesn't come natural for me, but I, I get on LinkedIn, I get on Facebook, I get on Instagram and I talk about like how, you know, the things that matter because I want people to know this is who I am. This is what matters to me. And that yeah. is definitely a form of self-promotion. I, I try to get on and in particular, look at my feed to see like the people that I know that I trust that I care about, you know, what are they talking about? Can I like it? Can I make a comment? Can I, can I share it and, and, yeah. and promote it to my network then because, you know, it matters to me. And I think some people just are not, um, I, I think Gen X in particular, we're not great at it. The boomers don't even know what it is because, I mean, we at least grew up digitally native to yeah, some extent. With some, well, with yeah. some dial-up networks. Yeah, <laughs> which is, but, but like our kids, my kids, they they get it. They understand influencers and followers. And um, so, Influence, I mean, I think it's changing yeah. or, I don't know, maybe it's just my hope, but, yeah. um, you know, I, and I think as more women promote themselves and promote others. Like it, it grows. I mean, you're going to laugh at me. This is so funny. So when game of Thrones originally came out, like what, 10, 15 years ago, yeah. um, I was just too busy. I just didn't have time to commit to like this, like series. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, my husband and I we were like, you know, we want something that like wow. we can watch when we have time, but we don't have to watch. Right. So we started game of Thrones we're on like season six or season seven. Already? And I'm like, Damn. how did I miss this? <laughs> this is such a like female empowerment. <laughs> like we're in season six and like all of the lead actors that are men, they're like, most of them are dead. And the like the <laughs> people that are leading and making progress are all women. And I'm like, hell to the yes, I'm got, I got to finish this out. We need more of that, right? Yeah. Like, because that then, you know, shows young women um, that, you know what, I can... I can be the mother of dragons, right? Like I can, yes, I can lead, can. <laughs> lead a group of men and, and be authoritative and still have, you know, still be nurturing and caring. And, you know, I, I cause women lead differently. We have different yeah. you know, goals and expectations and different drivers. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that. So I was watching Candy Cane Lane, which is the new Eddie Murphy on prime <laughs> and Tracy Ellis Ross is an operations manager. Oh my goodness. Of a warehouse with distribution and order turns and all sorts of stuff that she's talking about in this movie. And Audrey and I, you know, Audrey, right? She's yeah. on Thoughts and Coffee and all that. We're watching this and we're like, yes, yeah. a female of color, operations manager of a distribution facility, you know, talking to the investors, talking to the board and getting that promotion. And I'm sorry if I like totally ruined it for anybody who has not seen the movie, <laughs> but well, like that's, that's only that's one like, component of it, but. But, but no, think about that Think about it. Okay. So it's a, it's a woman, a woman of color, right. In a leadership position. But then beyond that, we, we, you know, it's supply chain, right? She's talking like, you know, we have movies where we, we see like the lives of doctors and lawyers and mechanics and firemen and policemen and all these kind of like careers. But have you ever actually watched anything that was like centered around like supply chain or where the, the character had, you know what I mean? Like, I so I think there's, there's a beauty in that as well. So awesome. <laughs> it was so awesome. We were literally like, I took a video of it. I think my team's going to post about it. I mean, stay tuned. So let's talk a little bit more about your journey. How has your journey sort of molded you? What does that look like? Cause you were mm -hmm. in manufacturing for a long time. What was it yeah. like being a woman in manufacturing for so long, but climbing the ranks and how did you champion other women to be part of manufacturing? Cause a lot of times people are like, we're not championing it enough. You know, women aren't looking at it as a career. Da, 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 da. But I think there's a lot of voices out there who are doing their own thing that aren't necessarily getting the praise, but that we need to learn from. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure I was a great champion back then. I mean, okay. that was, That's fair. you know, uh, late Livingstone. 90s, early 2000s, huh? Michelle Livingstone was on this series and she said, I did right before she retired, she was like, I did an absolute horrible job of championing yeah. other women. Uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, number one, I think I was so focused on proving myself. Okay. Um, you yeah. know, I, 
you know, I went to engineering school, you know, got into Whirlpool, was literally the only woman in the room um, in most meetings. And, you know, I was just continually having to prove myself. I couldn't make mistakes. I couldn't be emotional. I couldn't, you know, and not that I didn't have some people that I could trust that I could be genuine with, but publicly, you know, I, I really wasn't, it, it wasn't me. And it was a, it was a ton of pressure. Um, had two kids right away, got divorced when I was 30. So when I was 30, I had a huge chip on my shoulder. Um, you know, I was going to make it, I didn't need a man. Uh, and I, you know, I, I was single for almost a decade, um, investing in myself, investing in my, my children, investing in my career. Um, now I'm in a completely different place, right? I, uh, matured enough that I could recognize that it wasn't a weakness mm -hmm. to have a man in my life, you know, met my current husband and he is delightful but don't tell him I said that um because we like to harass each other and you would diminish my credibility there but um you know so I think you know I'm not sure it was great in the beginning it's something that I think now I I try to make amends for like you know I was like like kind of focused more on myself and now um as I grow I want other women to grow with me and I want to push other women up. Um, and that's a conscious effort on my part. It's, you know, why, um, you know, why one was so enthusiastic about the women in supply chain forum and uh, why I wanted to be on the board for the association of supply chain management. I mean, it's, it's how I negotiated for myself and my promotion because, you know, we're, we were talking about like multiple things. Oh, Christine, you know, take on this, you know, you know, CMO role. Nope. I'm, I'm not a CMO that diminishes all of the industry knowledge and background that I, that I bring. Huh. So, you know, really negotiated my title, my job description, um, really advocated that no, 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 no. I'm not going to do the job and prove that I can do it before you promote me. Um, you know, and, and, and then had a whole discussion and educated, you know, the team about, uh, prove bias, uh, and okay. how women often are promoted and, and hired for their accomplishments and not for their potential, um, which is not true for men. And it was like, no, 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 either, either I'm promotable because I have the potential and, you know, whatnot. And so, you know, I think um, you just kind of have to nibble away at it, Sarah, yeah. um, you know, in kind of everything you do. But um, I had somebody ask me recently, they're like, you've just, you've done so much. And you asked me earlier, like, what what do I want my legacy to be? Like if I could, yeah. you know, one thing, I really want leaders and businesses to understand that transferable skills matter um, in that diversity doesn't just mean like race, creed, color, nationality, and gender. It means really bringing together people that have diverse experiences and diverse backgrounds. And, and so for me, the common thread has been, I really thrive in chaos. Like I'm like a glutton for punishment. I, when something's <laughs> broken, like I am driven to fix it. And that's the common thread in everything I've done personally and professionally, something's been broken and I come in and I utilize my engineering and my an analytical mind and I assess what's broken and I bring forward recommendations to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, and so I've been really lucky. I've been able to convince people that those are transferable skills. I don't have to stay in appliance manufacturing. I can right. move to infant formula. I can move from developing refrigerators mm -hmm. to managing, you know, global production from a planning standpoint. So, and, and I think part of that is we, as women, we got to do a better job of that. We don't have to stay in our, in our swim lane, right? Yeah. Advocate, look, here's why I'm, I am awesome. And it's not just about my functional knowledge or my education. Yeah. It's about how I work, how I think, how I solve problems. Uh, and I can be an asset. I am writing all sorts of notes right now because I resonate with you on so many different levels. So going back to what you said about not being a very good champion, I don't think I was a very good champion either. And I resonated with you on so many levels. But what I want to do is I want to change the mindset around that because, you know, I think if you and I 
would have had more tools, resources, and people to emulate so that we did maybe get out of our own head a little bit and champion earlier, I think that would have helped. And so I think our generation, um, if we have not been a very good champion early on in our careers, how do we turn that around and make sure that other women early on in their careers understand what it means to champion others, depending on time, resources, energy, all of that, but that they can do it a lot earlier rather than later. Yeah, this is maybe where you and I diverge a little bit. Like okay. I look at um, my children and my nieces and nephews, and I'm not sure in your early 20s that you're supposed to be a champion. I think your job Fair is point. to learn and to grow. Now, I think, you know, there, I think it's, you know, teaching young people that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay. okay. You should want somebody to champion. You need to develop relationships, but I'm not sure that they, that they have to champion professionally. Now I would love to see, like, I am a huge proponent of like service, right? Like, can we get back? Like, how about everybody does like a year in the Peace Corps? Like, I, I feel like we're pushing people into college and careers and, and whatnot before they've really had a chance to to provide service to others. Right. So, okay. um, point. but, but that could help know, with it because huh? it's not necessarily about the championing. It's really about the service to others. It is because it is. what I'm hearing from both of us, right. Is that, that we were very, very in our own heads, very in our own careers. We had a lot going on, you know what I mean? And at that point in time in the universe, <laughs> We had to be strong. We could not, like, there was a lot of expectations on us as women that we had to live up to yeah. in the 90s, the early 2000s, that kind of thing. Okay. And I feel like there's more flexibility now, which gives a little bit more energy and room for that service, whether it is championing others or maybe learning and growing from somebody right. who didn't champion early on in their career to find out what it is that we need to look out for. Yeah. Maybe it's something small on a daily basis, right? Well, and don't you think that part of, like, as you get older, um, you have more experience. So, like, for me, I'm much more empathetic mm -hmm. now than what I was when I was younger because I've, and, and part of that is because mm -hmm. I've had my own struggles and trials and tribulations. But part of that is also because I was giving back, because I was volunteering, I was meeting and interacting with people from multiple countries, multiple cultures, multiple backgrounds at multiple places in life. Um, and so number one, I'm thankful, uh, for the support that I did have, yeah. um, both from my family, from my friends, from my peers. Um, but I reckon like now I recognize that my experience is not everybody else's experience. Right. And I think that that makes you a stronger leader. I think that makes you a better employee. Yeah. It also makes you a better peer and a better champion because yeah you can empathize strongly with others. Yeah, I think you can make more impact, right? Mm -hmm. The experience and knowledge that we come with a little bit later on in life. Yeah. So one of the other things that you said was that we have to be intentional and mindful of what we bring to the table, mm -hmm. right? What it is our transferable skills are because you mm -hmm. negotiated this particular uh, promotion and said, no, wait a second, we are not going to do this the traditional way because it doesn't work. And here's the reasons why it doesn't work. Here's right. what I'm bringing to the table. Here's my potential and what I'm looking to do and how I'm looking to get there. Now, right. I think this goes hand in hand with our comment earlier about promoting ourselves. If we don't understand our value and we promote ourselves in the public forum, how are we going to be able to do that behind closed doors when we're talking about a promotion like this? Right. And that's what resonated with me too. Yeah. And it's a muscle. Like I am better at it now than what I was even five or 10 years ago. Right. Yeah. Like, um, and, and, you know, the other thing that stuck out to me um, when we were at the women in supply chain forum a couple of weeks ago um, was somebody said, well, you know, if I do this and I do this and I do this and it still doesn't make any difference, what do I do? And like a dozen women in the audience are like, look for something else, right? Like <laughs> you don't have to stay there. Um, and so I think for me, I'm better at that now too, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, before I felt like I was a failure if I couldn't break that ceiling. And if, if we I weren't there for 20 years. 
Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And now I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try, I'm going to try to bring women along with me and, and be like a a different voice, Mm -hmm. uh, in the leadership. But you know what, sometimes you do the best you can. And you're like, you know what, this is the most progress I can make here. I'm not a failure if I move on and I take my skills with me, you know, um, but God, I was like close to 50 before I figured that out, (laughs) (laughs) but that's okay. Everybody has different journeys, Yeah, right? Everybody has different lessons to learn throughout this journey. And it's also not necessarily about age either. All right. Well, yeah. I mean, and I'm a type A personality, so you know, like I've had to learn to fail, uh, you know, as I've gotten older and and to, you know, accept that it teaches me things and that, right. you know, it doesn't diminish uh, the gifts that I bring. So question for you, because I feel like you always have a voice in the room right now. Did it take you some time to get there? Like oh, to yeah. find your voice? What was oh, yeah. that journey like? And do you have any advice for somebody that's sort of just learning how to get their voice? Um, you know, it's funny. I think if you talk to people that like were part of my, my peers, if you will, you know, in the nineties, when I started at Whirlpool, um, you know, they would, they would tell you that I was a lot more withdrawn. I was a lot more quiet. Mm. Um, you know, I, uh, really, you know, was like mindful of, you know, the words that I was speaking. And I, I was really trying to put myself in, like I wanted to be like them and I wasn't really being me per se. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I, I've been really lucky. I've had some really great mentors um, and some really great friends and peers that nurture me. They challenge me. They encourage me to speak up. You know, I'll come home. I'm complaining. Oh, this happened. That happened. <laughs> well, why didn't you say this? Why didn't you say mm-hmm. that? You know, um, and I describe it to people that for me, my journey has has really hinged on the fact that I've built a tribe, um, you know, so people that I trust, um, that I can reach out to, that I can ask questions, that I can be very vulnerable with. Um, and they don't, like at this point, they don't, they don't sugarcoat it, right? Like they, they don't hold back. Like, no, they don't hold back. And they you know, <laughs> sometimes they tell me things I don't want to hear. Um, but I think it's important. Like, I just, I didn't understand relationships, Sarah, when I was younger, I was, I was like results oriented. I was checking off all the boxes. I was doing all the things that I thought were expected of me and I wasn't getting the results that, or the recognition. And I was, I was floundering. So it was like, yeah, I mean, I, I had metrics and I met those metrics, but I, I was really missing that relationship side. And um, it, it doesn't matter who you know. It matters who is willing to speak for you and on your behalf. Do they know you well enough that mm-hmm. they trust you and they're willing to advocate for you? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, unfortunately, men historically have done a better job at this than women. Yeah, um, We get yeah. really focused in the day-to-day and we're taking care of kids and parents and houses. And, um, and, and I think we we don't prioritize that we need to build relationships. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm going to do an episode of blended coming up about the cost of allyship, because you talk about having somebody who can be an advocate and speak on your behalf. It comes with a lot of responsibility on both sides and cost anything like, like for me, it doesn't cost me anything to be an ally. It enriches Mm -hmm. my day. It, it brings, like, I, I just feel good about helping people. Right. Like, yeah, you know, it'll be interesting for you to listen to that episode because one of the ladies that I met recently in San Francisco is going to be on that. And she's written a whole bunch of stuff about the cost of allyship. And I think one of the things is just the responsibility on both sides. It's not that it's necessarily a bad cost, but it could be a bad cost if both sides aren't taking it seriously and the responsibility. So it'll be interesting. I haven't had that discussion yet. Um, but we have to understand, you know, those advocates, what exactly they're doing, what are they putting on the line for us? What does that mean? And how are we going to give back to either that relationship or how are we going to take that and do that for somebody else? For somebody else. Forward that kind of thing. 
All right. So if you and I were to meet a year from now, which could, I mean, for us, I hope it's before then, but <laughs> I hope it's before then too. But I think in real life, right. Mm -hmm. It's probably realistic that one year from now, potentially, because you're traveling all over, I'm traveling all over. Um, but if we were to meet in one year from now, what are some of the things that you, what maybe three things that you would like to see that you've done accomplished Anything. Yeah, I mean, I think professionally in the role that I'm in today, I I'm, you know, I have a whole new team. I would love to see that um my team is, you know, generating the results that the company requires and that they're being rewarded for it. So I think that would be the first thing. Uh I think secondly, um I would like to feel more like an influencer in supply chain. I think I have uh, a voice. I'm not always sure how, how to amplify it or use it. Um, so I think that that's an area that I'd like to spend some time. And then that. the third thing is purely personal. Mm -hmm. I am really hopeful that I am, I am done doing renovation and in my new house and my new space mm -hmm. that I can be proud of that I can like have my own little podcast room or something. And right. Like, um, because that is, like, you know, you just don't, you don't recognize, I don't think always, especially in this work from home environment, that if you don't enjoy the space around you, mm -hmm. like it kind of wears on you. I'm not like, yeah. I, I love where I'm at now. I moved my office. It's great, but it's still not mine. It's a rental. And you know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. so yeah. Um, I love yeah, that. I mean, you know, I, but I'm a simple person. Like I, it, I, I never was one of those people that had a five-year plan. I am a continuous learner. If something interests me, then that's the path that I go down and I'm very flexible. Uh, and I don't, you know, so I, I never knew I was going to be in supply chain. I'm an electrical engineer. Spent the first 12 years of my career in operations and then product development for one of the largest appliance companies in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, it's luck and happenstance. And then, um, for me, what's been intentional is that I like to learn. So mm -hmm. I did my Six Sigma black belt. I did, you know, a uh, certification through what used to be Apex, which is now the ASCM. I got my project management credentials. I did an MBA, like, like that for me is, is kind of, you know, I'm, I'm pretty willing to go with whatever interests me. Right. I love that. I love that. And you're a big supporter and cheerleader and we love you for it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I understand the feeling about being an influencer, but we all influence things in our own <laughs> way every single day. And so I hope you feel that because I really believe that about you. And so we have some exciting things happening in 2024. So stay tuned because Christine might be doing a regular spot on Let's Talk Supply Chain. Plus we've got the Secret Society of Supply Chain and she's going to be helping me with that and being part of our virtual monthly meetups and all that kind of stuff, which I cannot wait. So oh, go and check me. out, follow, connect Christine Barnhart on on LinkedIn. What's the website that you want to send everybody to? Uh, Newlogy.com. Um, you can find out, like I've got a whole profile on there. Um, you know, beyond that, I'm on LinkedIn, obviously, Christine Barnhart. Uh, I'm on Instagram, um, you know, either. Uh, I'm pretty flexible in how people reach out to me. And honestly, this was such a great experience for me a couple of weeks ago. One of the young women at the Women in Supply Chain Forum came up to me and was like, are you Christine Barnhart? I follow you. And I was like, I'm like, I'm still on a high from that. So if you follow me, if anything I've ever said, if it aggravates you, fine. If it, you know, helps you, fine. But come up, talk to me. Um, I'm, I'm pretty friendly. Um, I will pretty much talk to anybody for a few minutes. So I love that. Well, thank you so much for coming on the Woman in Supply Chain series, talking about your journey, what that's looked like, talking about investing in ourselves, supporting each other, and all sorts of things to end this year. Like we're ending 2023 on a high with Christine Barnhart talking <laughs> about women. How do we support it? Where did we start? What does that look like? How can we go into 2024 supporting each other? So, any last words? No, I mean, I hope you have a wonderful holiday. Uh, I'm headed to Toronto actually in the morning. Uh, I'm packing a whole extra suitcase just to bring home a case of um, Mott's Clamato Caesar pick pickled green beans. Um, 
because I'm an addict awesome. now and uh and I love Toronto and I love Canada so <laughs> all dress chips coffee crisp I'm gonna give you a whole list once I, I need a list okay send me the list anyways Christine thank you so much for joining me on the show today thanks Sarah I appreciate it Thank you.